First up is Zeus versus Hulk. Sometimes readers need a little bit of a reminder of the power hierarchy in the Marvel Universe. And sometimes it's the characters themselves who need reminding. The Hulk went up to Mount Olympus demanding Zeus to fix stuff after a big war, and Zeus just wasn't having it, and zapped Hulk down hard. But Hulk is tough, so even after getting hit by that mega lightning bolt, he kept on going. Hulk threw some serious punches at Zeus, but Zeus hit back even harder, like super hard. Hulk got sent flying off of Mount Olympus, but even that wasn't enough. He crawled all the way back up to Zeus for round two. Zeus, no longer playing around, smacks the Hulk down so dang hard that he can't help but spew green bodily fluids all over the place. I mean, imagine shattering the Hulk's rib cage so hard that his lungs collapse. Good lord. Then Zeus really lays into the Hulk, making him crash down into the mountain where he got stuck on a rock and knocking him unconscious. When the Hulk finally awoke, he found himself chained up and left for vultures to chow down on him. Zeus was gloating, watching Hulk's super healing power keep him alive while the birds had a feast on his stomach. Classic Zeus. At number 9 is Dakin versus the Punisher. One of the most brutal fights ever involves Dakin, Wolverine's son. So Dakin goes all out on Punisher, not holding back on an ounce of his brutality. It's a story where the Punisher gets cornered and Dakin just goes berserk on him. You see, at first, the Punisher starts off okay and takes control of the fight pretty early, but that doesn't last very long. The Punisher quickly gets overwhelmed by Dakin and meets one of the most brutal ends I have ever seen in comics. Because basically, Dakin just chops him up into pieces, limb by limb, and then insults him before kicking those pieces off of the rooftop. It's gruesome. Now the scary part is that Dakin doesn't show any remorse or regret for what he's done. He's just like that, a troublemaker who doesn't hold back. And this wasn't just some trick or plan by Punisher to fake his demise. No, 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 this is the real deal. Later on, Dakin kind of changes sides, tries to be a hero, and joins the Wolverine family. But he's got this dark side that pops up from time to time. Like, for example, that one time when he snuck off to Krakoa to get vengeance on those who hurt innocent mutants. He's got this cruelty streak that sets him apart, making him one of the deadliest fighters in Marvel. So even though he's on the hero team now, don't forget that Dakin can be seriously deadly when he wants to be. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 8 is Thanos versus Black Bolt. Now, Thanos in the MCU is a pretty tough guy, able to take on Cap, Thor, and Iron Man at the same freaking time, but in the comics? Phew, he's an even bigger deal. Now let's talk about Black Bolt. He's an inhuman and his voice is crazy powerful. I'm talking one whisper from this guy can vaporize Doctor Strange and the Sentry. Yeah, the Sentry, who is basically Marvel's version of Superman. And get this, he can even wipe out an entire planet just by using his voice. Now, this guy's voice is so lethal, he's been trained not to speak, like, ever. Not even in his sleep. That's how intense it is. Now, what happens when he tries to let loose on Thanos? Spoiler alert? Nothing. Not a scratch. Thanos barely flinches. It's like watching a bug bounce off of a windshield. Thanos takes a full-on shout from Black Bolt at point-blank range, and you know what happens? Thanos sticks his arm out, wraps his hand around Black Bolt's mouth, silencing him. Then, he silences Black Bolt for good, slamming his face into the ground beneath him, repeatedly. Black Bolt, as tough as he is, has no shot here. Thanos barely even broke a sweat. It's a brutal beatdown, a real mismatch, as, as Thanos came out without a scratch. Next on the list is Captain America vs. The Punisher. During the Civil War comic arc, The Punisher was recruited on Captain America's team for all of like 10 minutes. That all went up in smoke when a couple of goons showed up asking to be a part of the rebellion. Cap was about to let them on the team, but then The Punisher lit him up with bullets before anything could be made official. And that's when Cap snapped. He wailed on Frank Castle like nobody's business. The Punisher tried to reason between punches. After all, they were fighting over the lives of criminals, but that did not stop Cap from giving Castle the beating of a lifetime. Fists, feet, knees, shield, you name it, treated Frank like a punching bag. But the entire time, it was clear that this fight was a one-sided massacre, with Frank not throwing a single punch and Steve not pulling any of them. Then the moment came when Steve demanded Frank fight back, to which the Punisher replied, not against you, ending the fight when Cap walked away. 
Spider-Man theorized something about Cap being the reason why Frank became a soldier during Vietnam, which is more or less right. The Punisher exists to well, punish people. He fights against evil, and so Captain America, being the closest thing to an actual good, noble person as anybody has ever seen, and so there was nothing for Frank Castle to punish. Captain America is the Punisher's hero, and so he just let Rogers have his way with him. Totally brutal. Number six, Jean Grey versus Cordyceps Jones. Jean Grey is a force to be reckoned with, and not just because she was the host for the Phoenix Force either. Even without the insane power of the Phoenix Force bonded to her, Jean has actually done some pretty impossible things, let's be real, including almost single handedly defeating Null during the Absolute Carnage event. Yeah, while she ultimately didn't manage that brutal takedown on her own, she was at the very least integral to beating him down the line by helping to uncover the god of the symbiote's weakness. Jean has been an unstoppable force many times over while serving on the X-Men team. She truly showed how dangerous it is to mess with her when going up against Cordyceps Jones. She defeated him and his entire casino simply by trapping him in an illusion while the X-Men basically did their thing. From within that illusion, Jean says it best when it comes to just how powerful she is truly in issue 11 of the recent X-Men series. I was Marvel Girl, now I'm Jean Grey, I did not even let the Phoenix command me, so honestly, what chance do you have? Next on the list is Null versus the Sentry. In King in Black number one, Null shows up on Earth with an army of symbiote dragons, and the Avengers are all like, oh boy, we're in trouble. The Avengers try their best to fight back, but Null is just on another level. On top of the symbiote freaking dragons, he brings these huge Celestials covered in symbiotes and goes after Earth saying he's looking after a guy named Dylan Brock. Even when the Avengers try to bring in the Sentry, their big gun, Null straight up tears him apart and absorbs his insane powers. It's a shocker because Sentry is a powerhouse. I mean, this guy's strength is off the charts, like millions of exploding suns strong. In fact, the dude has ripped gods in half himself. So for Null to just dismantle him like he's nothing? And then to make matters worse, Null covers the Earth in symbiotes, blocks out the sun, and plunges everything into darkness. This Null dude is no joke. He proved he's basically the strongest being in the whole Marvel Universe, and taking him down is gonna be one seriously tough job. Number four, Sentry versus Ares. Speaking of people ripping each other in half, Sentry is the greatest hero that Earth forgot. In the Marvel Universe, as AJ was saying, he's basically like the Marvel equivalent of DC Superman, but quite a bit more messed up when it comes to his origins, and at times his approach to fighting baddies, to be honest. In fact, Sentry himself isn't only one of Earth's greatest and most powerful heroes, he's actually also one of its most powerful and terrifying villains, as residing within him is also the persona of the Void. The Void is the reason the whole world basically had to forget that Bob Reynolds was the hero known as the Sentry. In forgetting who the Sentry was, he disappeared, and with him so did his evil alter ego, the most villainous and deadly Void. Sentry, before getting himself ripped in half by Null, managed to rip Ares in half, that's how powerful and violent he can be. Of course, him getting ripped in half by Null does make sense, cause that feels like karma to me, my friends. Next up is Deadpool vs the Hulk. Okay, so technically speaking, this fight didn't actually happen, as this was all a twisted fantasy made up by Deadpool in his head, but it doesn't make it any less brutally mesmerizing. Deadpool, the merc with the mouth that just won't quit, is brainstorming story ideas with a comic creator in a She-Hulk-esque type sequence, where they're bouncing ideas back and forth trying to come up with something fresh and exciting for Deadpool's next adventure. About Deadpool's resilience, it's pretty insane. I mean, the dude has faced craziest stuff and managed to bounce back. Like, he's sort of like a cat with nine lives except he's got an endless supply of lives. Boat impalement, getting ripped apart by superheroes, getting turned into a cape, you name it, he's probably survived it. So in this story chat thing, Deadpool suggests fighting the big green Hulk. And lo and behold, the comic shows Hulk literally tearing Deadpool clean in half like he's made of paper mache. In one of Hulk's hands is Deadpool's legs and most of his torso, and in the other hand is his still screaming skull, each segment still connected by cords of his stretched tissue, and his freaking spinal column. It's the kind of stuff that makes you wince and go ouch, but it's unfortunately all in Deadpool's head. Like a what if scenario that never really happened, but it showcases just how tough and imaginative this guy can be, even when facing down the Hulk. Number two, Taskmaster versus Hyperion. This one is wild, especially when you consider the beating that Taskmaster was allowing himself to take. That's Right. While it might seem like Taskmaster is on the losing end of this fight here, he actually does come out on top in the end, despite getting beat down consistently throughout the fight. 
spoilers. We get to learn about how he actually had this one in the bag through flashbacks that we're shown during the fight, where it's revealed that Taskmaster's preparation was basically the key here. In the Taskmaster series, in issue number two, Taskmaster is working with Nick Fury to clear his name, but Tony Masters has to basically do something for Fury first. He needs to collect the kinesic signatures of three important individuals, one of whom is actually Phil Coulson. But to get to Phil, he has to go through Hyperion, and in order to do that, he has to first bring Hyperion's guard down, in essence allowing Hyperion to basically punch his way through Taskmaster so that he can do that. Ouch. Taskmaster, through feigning a loss though, is able to get Hyperion to drop his guard enough to get off a single powerful boomerang arrow shot, a Hawkeye classic to be sure, tipped with Hyperion's one weakness based on Fury's intel. So if you ever need to defeat Hyperion, just make sure you keep that on your person at all times. Coming up next is Gambit vs Captain America. Gambit, the X-Men dude who could turn anything into an explosive, has this epic face off with Captain America in AVX versus number two. So here's the deal. Cap is hunting down Hope Summers in the Savage Land, trying to prevent her from hooking up with the destructive Phoenix Force, while the X-Men, on the other hand, they're all about protecting Hope, thinking that the Phoenix could be a win for mutants. Enter Gambit and Cap. Clash time, baby. When Cap and Gambit go at it, Cap's not sweating it, and even when Gambit takes his mitts off on Cap's vibranium shield, charging the shield and sending it towards Cap like a bomb, Cap dodges it easily, and the vibranium shield doesn't combust per se, but boy oh boy does it leave an explosion like you've never seen before. Then Gambit gets sneaky, charging up Cap's superhero suit, which Cap thought was off limits. Gambit essentially turns Cap's entire outfit into a ticking time bomb. Cap's duds get trashed, and he gets serious, unrelentingly advancing towards Gambit, who's throwing everything he has at him at this point. And then that's when we get the grand finale. Boom! Cap's fist connects with Gambit's jaw, he decks Gambit hard, ending the tussle right there. Cap thought it would initially be a walk in the park, but Gambit pulled a pretty sneaky move. Now even though Cap won here, Gambit made him break a sweat, that's to be sure. That's how a simple tactic and a surprise move turned up the heat in this showdown. Number 10, Return from the Dead. While initially thought a goner after a run-in with the poisons in outer space, despite the fact that Carnage literally fell to Earth, he somehow was able to survive this. Sure, Cletus was burned up and killed on re-entry, with Carnage emerging to try and help save its host, giving its life for Cletus, who also, as I said, died, both of them gone. But at the end of the day, this brutal death wasn't even enough to stop Carnage from returning. Cletus's corpse was recovered by the cult of Null, who sought to resurrect him by returning Cletus to the world of the living through a small piece of the Grendel symbiote they had in their possession. Carnage was thereby reborn, returned to a sort of undead-like life, although completely conscious of what he was doing, and now psychically linked as well to the biggest bad of them all when it comes to symbiotes, the eldritch god of darkness himself. No. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us you love us by clicking that like button. It really does help. Feed the algorithm. Feed it. Number 9. Defeated his own offspring. Yep, you heard me right. Carnage is a father. To Toxin. However, when Carnage learned that he was pregnant, he was actually less than enthused. Instead, Carnage became paranoid and disgusted by the prospect. Carnage is all about taking life, not making it. So to him, that was pretty unacceptable. And then there was the worry that like how Carnage is often thought of as being more powerful than its parent Venom, definitely if we're talking to Carnage, that's what Carnage is going to say, Carnage's offspring in turn would be more powerful than Carnage, which was something Carnage could not abide. Needless to say, Carnage became obsessed with permanently defeating its offspring Toxin, but while Carnage would win a fight against Toxin, he would be prevented from fully destroying this new symbiote life. In the end, Carnage's win would be of a more temporary sort, and Toxin would actually go on to mainly become a force of good and kind of a hero. Number 8. Possess the Silver Surfer I don't even know how Carnage managed this one, but hey. I mean, I guess both the symbiote itself and the Silver Surfer are like cosmic in origin, but still, it seems like something Carnage shouldn't be able to do as someone who is more known as being more of a street level villain back in the 90s. However, it was the 90s still when Carnage managed to turn the tables on Silver Surfer, who was helping Spider-Man to track him down. Silver Surfer did so, but was surprised when the Carnage symbiote jumped from its host, Cletus Cassidy, and instead managed to possess him. Thankfully, the Silver Surfer would manage to regain control, but there is a What If comic that imagines a version of the tale where this was not possible. And the ending to that story is honestly pretty brutal. Number 7. Captain America vs. 
Captain America. We all battle our own inner demons once in a while, but for Captain America, he had to literally face his own evil self. In the Secret Empire storyline, a Hydra loving version of Steve Rogers, lovingly referred to as Stevel, had managed to take control of the entire United States, committing seriously heinous acts to ensure his success. Luckily, with the help of Kobik and Captain America's family of heroes, the regular Steve Rogers that we know and love managed to make it back to our reality. And he and Stevel finally went head to head in Secret Empire number 10. While Stevel had a completely different ideology than Captain America, he still retained all of his skill and tactical know-how, and was armed with a very Iron Man-like armor, which made this fight one of the most intense hand-to-hand -hand fights I have ever seen in a comic in a hot minute. While the two are evenly matched in terms of skill, Stevel is evil, and Cap is decidedly not evil, which means that Captain America is very much worthy of wielding the hammer of Thor, and Stevel was only capable of wielding disappointment. Number six. Thanos versus the Champion. The comic story known as Thanos Quest essentially recounts exactly how Thanos went about acquiring the Infinity Stones from across the universe. Now, Thanos faced various challenges and challengers to acquire each stone. The Power Stone specifically was held by a guy known as the Champion, an elder of the universe just like the Collector and the Grand Master. Thanos came upon Champion on a planet that is constantly fought over by five different factions, and he's just here fighting scores of soldiers for his own amusement. Thanos just swoops in and challenges Champion to a fight, which the Elder accepts without a second thought. Now, while Champion, powered by the Infinity Stone, is much more powerful than Thanos, he is effectively an idiot. Like, he didn't even know that the stone was the thing giving him his unlimited power. Thanos outthought Champion multiple times, even allowing Champ to destroy the entire planet that they were fighting on. Thanos didn't beat up Champion, but he outsmarted and embarrassed the guy to the point Champion traded the power gem for a toe to another planet. What an idiot. Number 5, Doom versus Thanos. Somehow, my fellow nerd compatriots have failed to recognize the sheer might and power that is Doom. Victor Von Doom has some of the best moments in Marvel Comics, and some of the beatings he puts down on other characters throughout are definitely worthy of this list. When Doom was ruler of Battleworld in the most recent Secret Wars event, very, very, very few could challenge his rule. But one who was foolish enough to do so was the Mad Titan Thanos. Thanos, being the rightly smug, extremely powerful Mad Titan he is, decides to challenge Doom straight on and refuses all of Doom's offers to just work with him. Thanos goes on a little rant about how when he had the Infinity Gauntlet, he acted as a god and he called Doom a weak god. In retort, Doom goes, Hmm, and do you have the Infinity Gauntlet now? To which Thanos replies, I do not, but I remain Thanos the Great Tyrant, and for you, that will be enough. That was stupid, because then, in one quick move, Doom simply plunges his hand into Thanos' chest, grabs a hold of his spine, and turns his body to ash as he says, that appears untrue. And it it's just one of the greatest comic book panels I have ever seen. Number 4, Doom vs. Spider-Man. Carrying along the Doctor Doom hype train, in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1, number 349 and 350, Doctor Doom and Spider-Man faced off, and it did not go well for the wall crawler. This time, Spidey was tracking a jewel thief named the Black Fox, but the Black Fox also had a certain Latverian ruler hot on his tail as well, as he had also bartered one of Victor Von Doom's family heirlooms, an emerald passed down to him by his late mother. And if you know anything about Doctor Doom, you never mess with anything related to Dr. Doom's mama. Doom flew to New York and just happened to catch up with the Black Fox at the same time that Spider-Man did. When Spidey intervened on the Black Fox's behalf, Dr. Doom did not hold back. Doom nonchalantly thrashed the web slinger, leaving him with his costume in tatters and desperately scrambling away for his life. While he convinced Doom to allow him time to retrieve his family heirloom, Peter's severe beating had left him concussed, so much so that he even hallucinated Uncle Ben. The beating he took taught Spidey and an important lesson about recognizing his limits. Coming in at number 3 today is Doctor Doom vs Reed Richards. But alas, Doctor Doom is a villain, and therefore, he has been defeated quite a few times. Quite possibly up there as one of the best one-on-one -on -one fights between Doctor Doom and his nemesis, Mr. Fantastic, came to us in Fantastic Four 1961, number 200, when these two college rivals resorted to a battle of fisticuffs. It was intense, with Doom characteristically monologuing the whole time. Even with Richards using his elastic body to try and overwhelm Doom, he fought Richards off, pummeling the man, and eventually getting his metal gloves around Reed's throat. Unfortunately, one of Doctor Doom's biggest weaknesses 
is his own face. Thanks to his power source short circuiting, the lock to Doom's mask was weakened, giving Reed the chance to pull it off, revealing Doom's face to a room full of mirrors. The lenses from Doom's mask couldn't protect him from the solar powered intensified reflections and drove him just a little bit bonkers. On one hand, Dr. Doom beat the snot out of Reed Richards, but Reed psychologically crippled Dr. Doom in one fell move. Number two, Black Tarantula versus Spider-Man. So showing up in The Amazing Spider-Man 432, Black Tarantula seemingly attacks our spider hero out of nowhere, chucking half a chimney at him as his first move. Now while Spider-Man tries to figure out who the heck this guy is and why he's even after Spider-Man, he is dodging out of the way of optic blasts, massive punches, and even his own webs do nothing as Tarantula just rips through them like tissue paper. Spider-Man even has a whole flashback about how Mary Jane wanted him to quit being Spider-Man, which was interrupted as Black Tarantula smashes through the wall Spider-Man was standing on. Spider-Man ends up floating down to an alley and while he gets maybe two or three punches on Tarantula, when the villain gets his hands on Spider-Man's ankle, it's all over. He slams Peter between the alleyway walls, then down onto the pavement, and then he literally rips off Peter's mask, revealing his bruised face, before telling him that he is sparing him so he can find Norman Osborn's missing child, but when he has done so, Spider-Man needs to leave New York for good. He then just walks off, leaving Peter in the fetal position, counting his injuries and thanking his lucky stars that he is alive. And finally, in at number one today is Moon Knight vs. Bushmaster. During Charlie Houston's 2006 run of the Moon Knight comics, in the second issue, Mark Spector recalls how he ended up in a wheelchair. And it was all because of his little fight that he had with his nemesis, Bushmaster. In a flashback, the two are brutally fighting each other along the rooftops until Bushmaster savagely throws Mark off of the roof and he crashes down, bouncing on and off of a fire escape below, breaking and crushing both of his knees at the same time. It is brutal with a capital B. But this is Moon Knight. Thinking he'd won, Bushmaster comes in for the final hit, but Mark lands multiple crescent darts deep in the villain's neck. But then, Mark isn't finished. He then climbs on top of his nemesis and using another dart, he relieves Bushmaster of his own face, giving him a look that resembles what his mask used to be, a face with the skin removed. Coming in at number 10 is Ultimate Captain America vs. Kleiser. The Ultimate Universe has a ton of absolutely insane moments to choose from, all of which would work for this list. But for this point, I want to talk about a time when Captain America went a little bit overboard. In Ultimates number 12, Captain America is caught in a fight with Herr Kleiser, an old German rival. Just for better context, Herr Kleiser is actually one of the Chitauri, and they launched a full-scale invasion of Earth in the modern day, which gave Captain America the opportunity to put Kleiser down for good. So, Herr Kleiser is naked following a fiery explosion and the two are just going punch for punch with Kleiser even getting the upper hand and ranting about eating Steve's face, which is weird. After Nick Fury tries to intervene and Kleiser tries to make Cap surrender, Captain America finally gets the upper hand. Now Captain America pins Kleiser down and lifts his shield above his head and slams it down edge first right into Kleiser's chest, basically slicing him in half. Then, Captain America insults the entire country of France, and it's really weird. Number 9, Captain Marvel vs. Thor. During quite possibly Carol Danvers' darkest storyline, The Last Avenger, taking place in Captain Marvel Volume 10, Number 12, a living suit controlled by a cosmic villain is forcing Carol to wipe out the Avengers. Issue Number 12 opens with Captain Marvel catching Thor, the God of Thunder, off of guard, launching a surprise attack to take him down. But Thor is a god, and it's going to take quite a lot more to bring him down. The two start a battle that sees them tear across the entire planet, from Greenland to Kansas to the middle of the the Pacific Ocean and then to space. Thor barely has any idea what's going on and Carol was just going ham. Carol managed to use an energy beam to send Mjolnir extremely far away into space and then another massive blast, she managed to incapacitate the God of Thunder and current ruler of Asgard. The final pages of this issue then show Carol displaying Thor's detached head. So yeah, a pretty brutal battle indeed. Blech. 
Number 8. Iron Man vs the Mandarin Nothing seems to ever get as intense, as destructive, as a battle between a hero and their nemesis. And in Invincible Iron Man number 28, Tony Stark and what is arguably his most well-known villain, the Mandarin, go head to head. At this time, Mandarin was carrying out a plan to release the extremist virus into the population that would wipe out anyone without a very specific genetic makeup, which was only a very small number of the population, and it would grant those who remained superpowers. Iron Man came into this fight hot and did not cool off until it was over. This fight was a knockdown drag out fight that saw Iron Man rip the ten rings from Mandarin's spine, engage in a battle of fisticuffs with this powerful old man, and then finally Stark repulsorated the ever living lights out of the Mandarin, who then proceeded to sick the extremist virus on Stark who used a refrigerant to not only halt the virus, but also freeze Mandarin solid. Iron Man then promptly passed out. At number 7, Punisher ends Doctor Doom. This one is absolutely brutal. You know, for as big as a bad guy as Doctor Doom is, it really doesn't take much for Frank Castle to absolutely obliterate him. And fairly easily too. This comes from the Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe comics. See, Castle isn't just up against Doom, but all of his Doom bots as well. However, they're all being remotely piloted by Doom, which means so long as Frank can fry the circuitry in Doom's noggin, the feedback loop easily takes care of the rest of the robots. Seriously, Doc, you should've used AI or Wi-Fi or something. All it takes is for Frank to slap a magnetic landmine on Dr. Doom's metal face, making his entire head burst into flames. But even a direct explosion to the face isn't enough to make a dent in that thick metal skull of his, so Frank results to a more brutal approach. With Dr. Doom incapacitated, Frank takes a steel hammer off the castle walls and tells Doom not to worry, as the two of them have all the time in the world. From outside of the castle walls, loud clanging can be heard like a bell as Punisher wails down on Doom's face. Clang, 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 squish. At number 6 is Deadpool vs an entire Armageddon. In this wild and emotional Marvel storyline, Deadpool's dad mode kicked in hard. So Deadpool, the wild and wacky mercenary, found his daughter was in danger. He had been through heaps of chaos and finally he had lost his chance at family bliss. But then, his daughter was alive and yet still under threat, so when the bad guys the ultimatum tried to take her out, Deadpool just couldn't take it anymore. He knew so long as he was Deadpool, the trouble magnet, his family would never be safe, so he made a heartbreaking choice, luring all of Ultimatum, like the whole army, to a showdown. And he went absolutely berserk. He used tech from Tony Stark, blew up choppers, drove drones into the ground, and went on a rampage like no other, fighting for his daughter with everything he had, but in the end, it cost him his life. Deadpool went out in a blaze of glory protecting his family. At number 5 is Thor vs Iron Man. In the comics, you'll notice a certain god of thunder was missing from the entire Civil War ordeal. And that's because at the time, Thor was deceased, but not for long of course, because this is comic books we're talking about. Now during this time, Iron Man was kind of a big shot running the show at S.H.I.E.L.D. and taking charge after winning the first Civil War. Captain America seemed out of the picture, and Stark even went out of his way to make a clone of Thor, which he used to lie to the world, saying Thor supported his cause. But then Thor came back, and he was not happy. Iron Man rolled in, thinking he could get Thor to join his team and follow the government's orders, but Thor was just not having it, especially with Iron Man acting all bossy and making clones of him and whatnot, so Thor shows him what's what. He thrashes Iron Man's super fancy suit, striking him multiple times with lightning and leaving him defenseless. Gripping Tony by the throat, Thor reminds Tony just who's the god and who's the puny mortal. Iron Man tries to smooth things over by offering Thor diplomatic immunity for Asgard. With his most powerful suit completely trashed, Tony ends up hitchhiking a ride back to town in the back of a pickup truck. At number 4, Spider-Man vs Phoenix Colossus and Phoenix magic. So the Phoenix Force is this super duper powerful energy which got split into five pieces by Iron Man's invention during the Avengers vs X-Men brawl. These bits of the Phoenix Force energy latched onto some of the X-Men giving them crazy amounts of power like basically turning them into walking talking hurricanes of strength. Among these supercharged X-Men were Colossus and Magic, both with their powers cranked up to 11. Colossus is this big tough dude whose skin is organic steel, basically making him a walking tank. Magic on the other hand can teleport and has some seriously magical mojo going on. These characters are obscenely powerful in their own right, let alone powered by a fifth of the Phoenix Force. Talk about OP. Now Spider-Man gets stuck facing these two juggernauts who are basically gods at this point. To battle them in single-handed combat would spell his doom, but Spider-Man does it anyway. 
He won't back down for the sake of his friends, no matter how many times he gets hit. But man, these guys were just too much for him. They pounded him hard, cracking his bones and leaving him barely able to breathe, let alone stand. It was a complete beatdown, and it certainly was sickening. Every one of Colossus's four punches crushed Spider-Man's head to a pile of bloody pulp. His spine was completely shattered. But here's where it gets nuts. Spider-Man, even though he's all beaten up, nay, completely crushed, refuses to give in. He knows that he clearly can't outmuscle them, so he pulls a genius move, tricking Colossus and Magic into fighting each other, making them knock the Phoenix Force right out of themselves. So at the end of the day, Spider-Man emerges victorious, not because he's the strongest, but because he's the smartest and most stubborn hero around. And yeah, he is stubborn. He didn't have to do all this, but he did it to help the Avengers escape. So selfless. That's why we love Spider-Man. He gets beaten many times more than you can count, but he never gives up and always manages to win somehow. At number three is Punisher versus Wolverine. In a wild comic book series, Punisher and Wolverine tangled in a brutal showdown where Punisher, feeling cornered, went to extreme lengths to take down this unrelenting mutant. First up, he used a shotgun to blow off Wolverine's face, which is a huge deal. I mean, not so much because of Wolverine's crazy fast healing factor. Even with his face half gone, Logan was still standing, so the Punisher decided to go even further with the next issue, aiming low and wiping out Wolverine's gonads talk about hitting below the belt where it hurts, but then there's more! You see, the Punisher was desperate to buy time, and so he went full throttle. He didn't just stop at the face or the man parts, no, no. He rolled over Wolverine with a steamroller, squashing him flat like a pancake. Now, obviously, Logan still manages to survive, which is obviously some serious serious level toughness, but that did knock him out of the fight for a good while. Now this whole thing shows how insanely tough Wolverine is, surviving stuff that would put anybody else down for good. At number two is Spider-Man vs. Kingpin in Back in Black. The clash with the Kingpin illuminated a different facet of the Web Slinger's character, notably during the Civil War arc in Marvel Comics. With Aunt May's life hanging in the balance due to Kingpin's orchestration, Peter found himself pushed beyond his usual moral thresholds. Striking a severe blow to the crime lord within the confines of a prison, Peter chose not to extinguish Kingpin's life. Instead, he dealt a far more nuanced form of retribution. In his relentless beating, Peter publicly stripped the Kingpin of his aura of invincibility and dominance. This action was more than just physical harm. It was an exhibition of psychological warfare too, revealing that the most impactful defeat can occur within the realms of perception and identity, rather than the purely physical. Though, I will say, it was physical. The message conveyed was super profound. By choosing not to end Kingpin's life, Spider-Man opted for a fate some might deem more excruciating. The knowledge of being bested in front of your peers, stripping away his veneer of invulnerability. And at number one is Magneto vs. Wolverine. Magneto vs. Wolverine in X-Men 25 was a brutal showdown. Magneto with his insane magnetic powers isn't exactly the ideal match for Wolverine. I mean, it's like pitting a Magikarp against a Jolteon. Like, come on, it's a one-sided massacre here. But Wolverine is tough as nails. He never backs down from a fight, even if it's not the smartest matchup. Now this particular time, Magneto went all out, unleashing his full magnetic fury on Wolverine's adamantium-coated skeleton, basically ripping the near-indestructible adamantium right off of Wolverine's bones, tearing it through his flesh, leaving chunks of it sticking out from all over his body. That didn't kill Wolverine. His super healing factor kicked in, barely managing to get through the pain. But for fans, that was a gut punch. The adamantium was a huge part of Wolverine's identity more than just his healing factor. It's what made him stand out, and for Mito to just yank that away so casually was devastating. Imagine you are Batman. You're exhausted from having faced numerous escaped criminals, coming home to your secret cave and or manor, only to find Bane, a hulking behemoth of a man, waiting to greet you. That would be terrifying, and that is exactly what happens in Batman number 497. Bane had organized a prison breakout in a secret attempt, sort of, to exhaust the Batman, to wind him down and break him down, so now, when this worn down, caught off guard Batman watches as Bane like pumps himself full of venom, the very thing that Bruce is also suffering withdrawals from, and is like talking about how Bruce Wayne is just a mask, but like a useless one, but his mask is very much useful, and then he's like, so you are familiar with venom, then you know what it can do. And he like explains how his venom is way more potent, and then Batman gets like, like a bit of a good speech, like I'll give him that, it was pretty good, and he like jumps into combat, and Bane's just like, Pow! 
nope. And he gives Batman an absolute thrashing. Like, he's throwing Batman around and beating the tar out of the guy, and Batman is like reliving all of his beatings up until this point, but they're like nothing like this, and Alfred literally can't even handle it, and he goes crawling off to get the Bat family, and Batman is like so exhausted that he can only try to dodge or just take the hits, but like, he goes to punch Bane, and it's like nothing, and then Bane's like, you are already broken. And then Bane just wipes the floor, the ceilings, the walls with Bruce Wayne, breaks his back, and then he leaves him destroyed on the ground. It's sick, and it's sick and twisted, but it's awesome. Next up today, the Wolverine villain Cyber is, in my opinion, kind of underrated, but he's one of the only villains to actually terrify the mutant, with some adamantium coated skin, toxic claws, and the power to track an individual's brain. Oh, and he's like nine feet tall and massive. In 1994's Wolverine number 79, Cyber is tracking down Wolverine in order to claim his adamantium bones, which he wants to then make a profit from. Unfortunately, at this time, Wolverine actually doesn't have the adamantium fused to his bones. So when the fight leads to him popping his bone claws, Cyber is a little bit disappointed. But instead of just walking away after this revelation, a cannon goes off nearby, and this gives Wolverine the opportunity to slash Cyber across the face. But as soon as the attack attack happens, Cyber catches Wolverine's fist and in one stomp, he snaps Wolverine's claws in half. This event scarred Wolverine, but right after it, even made him question his ability as a hero without his adamantium. Number 7. The United States of Carnage While this plan didn't fully work and it was only a temporary victory, Carnage still successfully messed up a lot of folks' lives when he took hold of a small town in America. He managed to absorb a ton of blood from a meat packing plant that operated there which boosted his power. Then he infected the water supply, turning the inhabitants of the town into his own playthings. He tormented them, making them do terrible things to themselves and one another, claiming the whole town as kind of his family. It was really messed up. In the end, the heroes do manage to reel him back in, but even then he had some pretty big small victories over the town's residents. Big in the sense of to the Residents, they'd be pretty big losses, but you know, to someone like Carnage, it's just like another tick in a box. The town's residents, in the end, also wanted him not just gone and arrested, but dead for what he'd done to them. So, despite the heroes winning the day, the end of the tale kind of makes you wonder what a victory over Carnage really looks like. Because, like, did did the heroes really win? Because there were still a bunch of terrible things that happened, and there wasn't a lot of closure. Number six. The Avengers are Carnage. Not only was Carnage able to take over the whole town, but when the Avengers at first responded, Carnage was also able to take them over as well. Like the others in the town, he managed to infect them as a symbiote and even bend them to his will. That's how powerful he was at the time. So despite the fact that the heroes were pretty quick to take action here, it didn't lead to a swift and pleasant ending resolution thing. Just the opposite. In fact, Carnage also threatened to make them do unspeakable things should they try to resist his will or should he simply basically feel like it really? Carnage ultimately was removed from these heroes and they did end up becoming free once more, but for a while there, they were pretty powerless to stop him. And it was pretty scary. Like, a carnage eyes thing? I don't think we want that. Number five, impersonated Eddie Brock. Cletus doesn't do anything halfway, I will give him that. At the beginning of the Absolute Carnage event, he decided to come back for Eddie Brock, not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally as well. His plan was to completely discredit Brock by ruining his good name. How did he do this? By impersonating him and getting himself arrested. Not only that, but Carnage then proceeded to eliminate various inmates who he himself was trying to get close to on his journey to amass Codices, or Codexes, if you prefer. One such person is Lee Price. Since he had been impersonating Eddie while locked up, the murders he committed while in jail were also pinned on Eddie Brock, ruining his reputation even further. Number four, even defeat brings victory. I think one of the most wild things about Carnage is that even when he loses, he somehow wins. Case in point, the end of King in Black. Null is defeated, Eddie becomes the new King in Black. This event of Null coming to Earth was all something that was pretty much set into motion by Carnage thanks to his actions in the Absolute Carnage event. So what happens to him? Is he also defeated? Does he suffer for the pain he caused and brought in this event? No, not even close. I mean, he does, but not really, not long term. At the end of this event, instead of also 
remaining permanently defeated, Carnage and Cletus are instead reunited in death with each other thanks to the symbiote hive mind. Now I have some questions about the symbiote hive mind, but I'm gonna table those for now. Honestly, I could do a whole list on the symbiote hive mind. If you want that, let us know in the comments. And I'm just gonna accept this because this is Carnage and this is Cletus, and together as Carnage, at this point, it feels like they're completely unkillable. They just keep coming back. So. Very well. Number three, Return of Null. Even when he loses, he really does win. Case in point, the end of the Absolute Carnage event. It was here that Cletus gave Eddie the choice between the saving the world or saving his son. And it wasn't even really that simple. It was more like save your son and the world becomes like a victim to Null or don't and the world still kind of becomes a victim to Null. Because it was like either Carnage was gonna wake up Null or Eddie was gonna wake up Null. But either way, it wasn't gonna be good. Pretty much either way, Null was just waking up and it was just whether or not Eddie would be the one responsible for that. In the end, Eddie chose to save Dylan, and in that way set up and was ultimately responsible for the awakening and the return of Null. This was truly one of the most brutal defeats to read, because either way, Eddie would lose and Carnage would win, even if he didn't survive. And ultimately, it turned out he somehow did survive anyways, so whatever, I guess. There are no consequences. Number two, Ghost Rider can't take this heat. Carnage had a heyday during the Absolute Carnage event. He was defeating heroes and villains left, right, and center. Anyone who had basically come into contact with the symbiote in the past was a target. Carnage's goal was to collect all the codices which were located in the spines of all those who had even been bonded to a symbiote at some point in their life. This long, long list included Alejandra Jones. Alejandra, if you don't remember, uh, was also a spirit of vengeance, a ghost rider. However, by the time Carnage had arrived on her doorstep, she'd expended much of her power and was using the last bit of her reserves to basically just keep her village safe. And that's when Carnage showed up and brutally took her out. She was sent down to hell after her life was ended, but she did at least manage to return to get some final vengeance on Carnage and to protect the people of her village. So at least there's that, but still, it was a pretty brutal defeat. I remember reading it and being like, what? <laughs> Whoa. Number one, eliminating Venom. Well, okay, so Carnage hasn't completed this task yet, as far as I know, unless something has happened in the comics that I haven't read yet, and it's more building up to a boiling point right now. But he has eliminated many different Venoms, and he's working on eliminating all of them, including the main one. Right now, Carnage's goal is to come for Eddie Brock, killing all the versions of Venom from across the multiverse, including that of the prime continuity one, so that he might replace him and become the new King in Black. Because like, as long as Eddie exists in some form, he's kind of still the King in Black. It's a whole thing. Go read the Venom series, that'll all make a lot more sense. Or maybe it won't, but at least it's explained. It's a pretty deadly game, but Carnage has been so power boosted since the days of Absolute Carnage that I would not be surprised if Carnage actually does win here. Honestly, the level of like magic story writing you would need to work to get Venom out of this one might actually be less interesting than if you just let him win here and then we see what happens next. But we'll have to see where it goes. Either way, time will tell if Carnage will fully or only temporarily be victorious, as he so often is with battles. Usually temporary win, but not long term. I mean, we hope. I mean, he's pretty unhinged. Number 10, Batman. Batman is perhaps the poster boy for miserable superheroes. When he was a child, he of course saw his parents die in front of him, causing him to vow to protect Gotham City from crime as Batman. Batman has witnessed many tragedies during his time in the cowl, and has had his fair share of horrible things happen to him, such as losing one of his sons Jason, as well as his father figure and faithful butler, Alfred. He has also had to deal with several horrible injuries, such as being repeatedly shot and stabbed, and having his back broken. He also got left at the altar on his wedding day, which was not great for his mental health, I'm sure. Despite being a character who is very much defined by what he has lost, he has probably gained more over the years. He has a massive family of both biological and adopted children, and has an extensive collection of allies and friends. On top of this, most of the things that he has lost have come back to him over the years. He lost Jason Todd, but he returned to life. The same thing happened when he lost Damian Wayne or Stephanie Brown. Out of all the major losses, the only ones that have stuck are his parents and Alfred. And let's face it, Alfred coming back is only a matter of time. Batman's life is better than he lets on. 
And he's probably just depressed, which is why he's at the bottom of this particular list. Number 9, Angel. Warren Worthington III was one of the original X-Men, having giant bird wings that allowed him to fly as Angel. He spent years as a hero until the mutant massacre. He was captured by the Marauders, who then cut off his wings and crucified him. This caused him to spiral into an awful depression, which eventually led to him trying to take his own life. This was prevented when Apocalypse showed up and made Angel an offer. He would give him back his wings if Angel would become one of the horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Archangel of Death. This got him his wings back, but caused a host of other problems with him having to work to resist the evil force that was put inside him ever since. Number 8, Scarlet Witch. Wanda Maximoff has gone back and forth between hero and villain during her many years at Marvel Comics, with her being responsible for a lot of horrible things that have happened, such as the infamous No More Mutants thing. But that is not to say that she hasn't had a somewhat tragic life herself. Things didn't get off to a good start when she was kidnapped from her mother as a baby by the High Evolutionary who experimented on her to give her powers. While staying with old HE, a demon named Cthon chose her to be his vessel, trying to possess her multiple times. She tried to put out a fire in her village with her powers, and people assumed that she was the one who started it and attacked her. This led to her being saved by Magneto and joining the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. She eventually became an Avenger and married her teammate Vision. She she used her powers to create a pair of twin boys for her to raise. This made reality unstable, and Wanda was forced to give them up, and they faded from existence. This led her down a dark road where bad stuff continued to both happen to her and because of her. She has had a far from easy life. Marvel's Civil War number two is not the greatest, and it makes Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, to be someone who is just pretty unlikable. She just makes really weird decisions, decisions that get people hurt badly, like taking her ultimates, admittedly a pretty powerful team, to take on Thanos thanks to an inhuman precognitive telling her that he will be there. Thanos shows up looking for the cosmic cube, which isn't actually on Earth, and Carol's tactic of just hit him as hard as you can, as fast as you can, probably sounds good, but it's also not really a plan at all. Carol absorbs an energy blast, the human torch is able to hit him with some fire, She-Hulk gets to pin him down, giving Carol and Dazzler the chance to blast him, and War Machine gets to lay down some fire. Thanos, sure, he's a little bruised, but he is a okay. Because when the inhuman Medusa tries to use her hair to like bind Thanos, he grabs that hair and flings her straight into War Machine, who accidentally fires a missile at She Hulk. Then, in the chaos following that explosion, Thanos springs on War Machine, punching him straight through the chest with his massive, mad titan purple grimace fist. Then, the ultimates are able to hit Thanos hard enough to end the fight, but damn. Now, listen, nerds, I gotta be honest. I never realized how vicious the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles can actually be. Taking place in IDW's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number 44, the turtles got split up. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raph are on a mission to stop Krang from literally destroying all life on Earth using the Technodrome, leaving Donatello alone with his bow staff facing off against Bebop and Rocksteady, who were given orders to send Donnie to the grave. Now that bow staff gets maybe one hit in before Rocksteady uses a sledgehammer Hammer to send Donnie flying, and Bebop just snaps the staff in half over his knee. Even with some assistance from Metalhead, Donnie is still at a disadvantage, and as he tries to escape, he gets a TV chucked at him, and then he gets slapped across the face with a computer keyboard. Then the pair just go to town on the Lone Turtle before Rocksteady uses that sledgehammer to crack open Donnie's shell. It is brutal. Luckily though, they are called off before they can fully finish the job. In the Infinite Crisis event, Connor Kent decides to answer the door, only to find Superboy Prime, who is starting to go a little bit off the deep end. And he decides to explain how he is the one true Superboy, and he wants to do that by fighting. And it is intense. Even Crypto gets involved, receiving a kick to the neck from Superboy Prime. And after that little crime against humanity, things get real. Prime beats the snot out of Connor Kent, chucking cars and all manner of things. But Connor had called in the Teen Titans, who in turn call in the Justice Society and the Doom Patrol. That's 28 different heroes. But this only makes things worse. Prime basically is like a kid, and he doesn't know how to control this power properly or even understand what is even happening right now. He starts wiping out heroes, accidentally taking the head off of Panther. He then rips off Risk's arm and wipes out Bushido and Baby Wildebeest with his heat vision while he is crying. It takes a handful of speedsters to then trap Prime in this 
Speed Force and end the fight. Okay, maybe a bit of a controversial pick here, but Superman Returns has made the list. The movie, I'm talking about the movie. Basically, Lex Luthor has used kryptonite to grow a massive landmass out in the ocean, which leaves Superman completely vulnerable. He lands on the new island and it's bad news from the get-go. Lex and his goons have already gotten in position on this kind of krypton-like island, but underneath, embedded into the rocks, is pure kryptonite. Tons of it. So it makes it incredibly easy for Lex Luthor to push Superman down these rocky stairs and then kick him while he's down, literally and figuratively. And then his goons start giving Superman this beating that actually kind of feels pretty scary and real, and I was like not expecting that at all. I don't think I've ever seen Superman so unable to do anything, and then Lex has like this sharp piece of kryptonite that he breaks off in this gasping for air Superman, who then falls off of a cliff. Moving on, John Walker, aka US Agent, is not the most loved character out there, but while he is a bit of like an anti-hero, he's still a hero from time to time. For example, when he answers the call to fight against Norman Osborn and his goons during the events of Siege. In The Mighty Avengers number 36, he attempts to stop the Thunderbolts from stealing Odin's spear. Unfortunately, another USA affiliated bad guy who is slightly crazy is also on the field today, and his name is Nuke, and he is pretty ruthless. Nuke is able to use the spear against US Agent, slicing off both his left arm and left leg. US Agent would go on to be wheelchair bound, refusing any enhanced cybernetics, and somehow he was still actually pretty capable. Moving on to the third spot today, Atlas is a character for DC Comics comics created by Jack Kirby joining the comics in the 70s. He was always intended as a kind of anti-hero and he has more or less played out that way since. But in 2010, Atlas was brainwashed by an unknown villain to attack the Justice League and he is one of the few characters to absolutely pummel the tar out of Superman. Sure, Superman could be slightly holding back against this fellow hero, but I've always kind of hated that argument because then it makes me think that Superman is just faking it when he gets absolutely rocked and I feel like that's not the case here. Atlas is taking Superman to the cleaners. They're going hit for hit, but Superman, even with help, he just can't take it, and Atlas eventually knocks him down to the concrete. Now, coming up second to last today, following the events of Original Sin, where Thor becomes unworthy to wield Mjolnir, Odin's son attempts to continue his superhero career in Thor number one. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't really turn out too well for him when the axe, Yarnbjorn, proves to be a pretty poor substitute for his mighty hammer. In battle with Malekith the Accursed and the Frost Giants, Thor has his arm severed off with his own axe and he's left to perish at the bottom of the ocean. The new female Thor, who's actually Jane Foster, becomes the wielder of Mjolnir and it is up to her to defeat Malekith. The original Thor does return with a new metal arm made out of black Uru and initially he wants his hammer back but then he sees Jane Foster handling it pretty well and he just decides to drop the Thor title completely and just goes by Odin's son instead. The man was crushed. And finally, in the infamous A Death in the Family story, DC not only slew a Robin, but they did it in the most disturbing way they could have. Jason Todd had disobeyed direct orders from Bruce Wayne to not go near the Joker. The problem was that Jason had just met his birth mother for the first time, who it turned out was a criminal working for the Joker. Also, he's Jason Todd, so he just didn't listen. He went to the warehouse where the Joker and his goons were at with the intention of saving his mom. But in a heartbreaking turn of events, his own mom betrayed him to the Joker to save herself, which of course doesn't actually save her at all. And the Joker leaves her to pass away with Jason anyways. Joker is shown repeatedly beating the snot out of Jason Todd with a crowbar. It's harrowing. Joker leaves him suffering on the brink with an explosive device and the hero manages to push through his injuries to get to the door with the help of his mom, only to find out that the Joker had locked them both inside. Number 10, Superman versus Batman. This fight doesn't even come from the main continent hailing instead from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns continuity of Earth 31. But it was so brutal that it was still incorporated into the main continuity of the DCEU at the time. Batman at this point in his story in this alternate world in the comics is not only still without superpowers, but he was also retired. When he decides to return from retirement, Superman is tasked with taking him out, ordered to do so by the president. But Batman isn't prepared to go down without a fight and a bloody, brutal 
brutal and desperate battle ensues between these two heroes. At the end of the story, we later find out Batman seemingly won in his own smart way. Typical Batman. While Batman seemingly dies during the fight, we later learn at the funeral that he is still alive and well, and that Clark may have even been in on this plan the whole time. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love it when we talk about brutal fights, be sure to check out our brutal playlist for even more content like this. Number 9. Batman vs Green Lantern For this point, we're not talking about Hal Jordan, but instead everyone's favorite lantern, well, some people's favorite lantern anyways, Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner is a Green Lantern who's been known to get on his teammates' nerves. At times, his cockiness is just too much for his fellow heroes, which seems to be the case here for Batman, who in his frustration referred to Gardner as a mongrel. Guy does not take kindly to this insult, and with tensions already having been built prior, he challenges Batman to a fight. A fight he is sure to lose considering he decides to remove his lantern ring to even the playing field. Batman accepts his challenge and knocks him out in one punch. Number 8. Bane vs Batman Probably one of the most famous fights in comic book history. In this fight, Batman is brutalized by Bane. Bane ends up escaping Arkham and decides to see how much havoc he can cause. When Batman ends up overwhelmed by the hordes of recently escaped criminals swarming the streets of Gotham, Bane takes this as an opportunity to strike. Run down and exhausted after three months of non-stop fighting with barely any time to rest, Batman is easily defeated by the villain who famously breaks Batman's back over his knee. Though really the most impressive and brutal feat was honestly getting Batman to such a fragile point which is not easy to do. Batman would recover from this and ultimately return but it would take him quite some time to heal. In the interim he'd be forced to call on someone to replace him, ultimately choosing Jean Paul Valley's Azrael. Number 7. Spider Man Spider Man lost his parents when he was a young boy and he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle. When he developed spider powers he chose not to stop a criminal who went on to kill his uncle Ben and as a result he became a superhero with a guilt complex named Spider-Man. Spider-Man has certainly had his fair share of losses with his parents, his uncle, and his first great love Gwen Stacy, who got thrown off a bridge and died from whiplash when Peter tried to catch her with a web line. He's had some major wins as well though, having dated some of the most absurdly attractive women in comics and getting married to his perfect partner, Mary Jane Watson. Although this was undone in a deal with a demon in order to save Peter's Aunt May. Since then, and it's been a downward spiral, with Marvel editorial seemingly being unwilling for Peter to grow as a person. They let him and Mary Jane become pregnant, but then made the child a miscarriage at the last minute. They undid his marriage, they made him the head of a big company which he then lost. He became a teacher but was fired. It seems like any time he's about to move into a new era, something happens that makes him single, broke, and taking pictures of himself for the bugle for money. He has a less intense series of losses than a lot of the others on this list, but it's just a constant stream of pain and anguish for the poor guy. Sometimes to the point that it doesn't even make sense. He recently broke up with Mary Jane, and six months later she's with some guy named Paul and some kids are calling her mommy. Spider-Man is known for having a rough life, but Marvel needs to let him be happy for a bit, just for something different. Number 6. Daredevil Daredevil is another character who almost notoriously can't seem to catch a break. When he was a child, Matt Murdock was in an accident that caused a radioactive isotope to get in his eyes, blinding him. It also gave him heightened senses and amazing abilities, but life wasn't through with him yet. His father was a boxer who refused to throw a fight, for which he was killed, leaving Matt with no family to speak of. He became Daredevil as well as a lawyer, but it has been far from an easy gig. One of his loves, Elektra, was killed by the villain Bullseye, as if that wasn't bad enough, Bullseye would later end the life of Matt's other great love, Karen Page. Speaking of Karen, she was an addict who sold Daredevil's secret identity for a fix, which allowed the Kingpin to systematically destroy Matt's life. It eventually got back on track and Elektra eventually returned to life, but Matt has had to deal with his secret identity, getting leaked constantly, getting possessed by a demon that made him murder people, being sent to prison multiple times, and having an almost constant tension with the people who care about him. On top of 
above all of that, he has massive Catholic guilt, which just makes everyone feel worse. Number five, Martian Manhunter. Martian Manhunter's life since he came to Earth has been pretty good, all things considered, but his backstory is just so brutal that it earns him a spot on this list. John Jones was born on the planet Mars, where he lived with his wife and daughter. This idyllic life came to an end when John's evil twin created a virus that made Martians burst into flames when they used their psychic powers. Due to this virus, John had to watch his wife, his child, and everyone he ever knew burst into flames. When a scientist on Earth attempted to make contact with Mars with the use of a transmitter, it instead transported John to Earth where he became the hero, Martian Manhunter. He has handled the loss incredibly well, but losing everyone you ever knew in one of the most painful and brutal ways possible is simply a terrible way to live. Number four, Guardian. James Hudson of Alpha Flight has had a rough go of it. He was raised by a single mother after his father father was killed in a knife fight when he was just a child. He never wanted to be a superhero, but after he developed the Alpha Flight program and its chosen leader, Wolverine, left, he had no choice but to step up. His suit's power pack overloaded in Alpha Flight 12, causing him to light on fire in front of his wife and for him to be presumed dead. He was actually transported to a different planet 10,000 years in the past. The alien inhabitants tried to repair him, but confused his power suit for part of him and turned him into a cyborg before putting him in cryo sleep and sending him back to Earth. He returned after having been gone for two years and was reunited with his wife. Less than 10 issues later, he was forced to sacrifice his life in order to fight Galactus and was considered dead again. He was actually found and captured by the evil master and brainwashed into becoming a villain against his old team. He overcame this and was finally free to live his life until he discovered an evil plan from the government and his suit was sabotaged to send him to deep space, making everyone think he was dead again. The government made a younger clone of him that began dating his wife until Hudson came back only to discover that his wife had broken up with his clone and was now dating his teammate Puck. The clone later died and he was able to win Heather back and the two had a child. But on the day she was born, a rogue government employee who wanted Heather for himself shot James out of the sky, causing him to break every bone in his body and almost die again. Wolverine gave him a transfusion that helped to heal him and he was free to live his his life, until him, his wife, and his team were killed by the Collective, leaving his daughter to be raised by distant relatives. He and Heather came back to life, but their dangerous lifestyle caused the courts to refuse them custody. Heather was brainwashed by the Master into being a villain, and she killed her relatives to get her baby, causing her to become a wanted fugitive with his child. He eventually tracked them down and put them in a hollow prison where they could be safe and not hunted, but his wife made it clear that she was still leaving him. So for those counting, he's dying died like five times, and every time he comes back to life, his life actually gets way worse than it was before. Number three, the Hulk. Even before he became the Hulk, Bruce Banner led a pretty miserable life. His father was a violent drunk who would hurt Bruce and ended up killing his mother in front of the young boy. He threatened Bruce until he lied in court, saying that his father didn't do it, but after Brian drunkenly boasted about the crime, he was put in a mental institution. Bruce spent his childhood suffering from mental health issues, and 15 years later, Brian was released into Bruce's care. While visiting his mom's grave on Christmas Eve, Brian attacked Bruce and Bruce pushed him, causing him to crack his head open and die because of the gravestone. Bruce repressed this memory and grew up to be a great scientist. While testing his gamma bomb, Bruce realized that a teenager had wandered onto the test site and got him to safety, getting caught in the blast himself. This changed him so that whenever he became angry, he would transform into the Hulk, a giant green rage monster. He has spent much of his life since then constantly on the run and being hunted like an animal by the US military. Even when he manages to be a hero for a while, it's never long before someone decides he's too dangerous and needs to be taken out. Bruce lives a life on the run with nothing of his own, not even the clothes on his back, which he loses when he transforms. He has managed to develop a support system like his wife and Rick Jones, but between the multiple personalities and the constant battle with supervillains, he has led a pretty rough life. Number two, Deadpool. Wade Wilson was a Canadian who moved from Canada and joined the Special Forces in the US, and later became a CIA 
Jackson until he fell in love with the mutant Vanessa Carlisle. Things were good for a while until he developed 34 inoperable cancerous tumors. He left Vanessa and returned home to die. He was recruited into the infamous Weapon X program and given a healing factor which caused the cancer cells to multiply, leaving him hideously disfigured. He was sent to a facility for hospice where the villain Ajax tortured him until Wade escaped and became a mercenary again. He was driven insane from all of this and became the Deadpool we all know and love today. Although he can heal from any injury, Wade is constantly put through the ringer, being given some of the worst physical damage and torture that anyone could endure. He has trouble getting other heroes to respect him or treat him well, and had to give up his daughter because he felt that being around her would only put her in danger. He has a good heart, but there are few superheroes who have endured the amount of pain Deadpool has. Well, except of course, number one, Wolverine. Wolverine was originally James Howlett, a Canadian living in the late 1800s. When he was a young boy, his groundskeeper killed his father and tried to kidnap his mother. His mutation manifested at this moment, with him popping bone claws, which he used to kill the attacker. Turned out, the groundskeeper was his real father, and his mother sent him away before taking her own life with a shotgun. And it just gets worse from there. Wolverine has lived a long life, and therefore has seen almost everyone he's ever loved die, including his wife Itsu and Jean. Jean Grey multiple times. He spent many years traveling the world until he was subjected to the experiments of the Weapon X program, who gave him his trademark metal claws. In the years after this, he fought many foes and was subjected to pretty much any injury you can think of, be it having his metal skeleton pulled out or being run over by a steamroller. In a more recent example of his terrible life, he was forced to fight a group of killers who were after him called the Mongrels. He killed all of them before he was informed that every member of the team had actually been one of his children that he had conceived during his wandering years. Rough, dude. But I think one of my all time favorite series for iconic and memorable phrase, especially brutal ones, has to be Invincible. What makes these fights stand out isn't just the brutality, but the emotional connection you have to these characters involved, which honestly makes them not just physically brutal, but honestly emotionally brutal as well. Take, for example, the fighting between Conquest and Invincible. Conquest arrived at a time when Mark was going through some pretty intense stuff. So he was ready to let go and punch something as hard as he could. However, this is conquest we're talking about. So even when Adam Eve flew in to act as backup, this fight ended up becoming quite messy. Like many fights in Invincible, this one spanned multiple issues, being wrapped up in issue number 65 after coming to a very gruesome end in issue number 64. Speaking of gruesome, let's turn to something that is also very gruesome. Is it more gruesome? I guess in some parts it kind of is actually. We're talking about Walking Dead. Honestly, reading this fight just made my draw literally drop. Now granted, I'm not as well versed in the Walking Dead series, so anytime I come to this comic and read a few issues, I'm always pretty much shook by what I read here. It's just, it's a lot of a lot. And this instance of course was no different. In fact, it is probably a beatdown that'll stay with me for some time. In this fight, Rick takes on a group of marauders, unlike in the Walking Dead show where this group is actually more specific, a group we've become familiar with who are known as the Claimers. In the comic, they're just kind of like a random group, I believe, of awful survivors. In the comics, Rick also only has one hand at this point, so keep that in mind, having lost it to the governor. But even with him having both hands in the show at this point, they made the ending to this fight the same. And both endings are brutal. With Rick in a bind, his arms restricted at his sides, he's asked, what are you going to do now? He responds by biting the man's neck zombie style. Uh, yeah. Also, I just love how so many of the images from the show and the comic in this fight, like when I went back to watch the scene, are like one for one from the panels. It's pretty awesome. Up next, Marco and Alana are the two main characters from the Saga series. At least, they are at the start. The series begins with them both in the middle of delivering their first child while also being hunted down for having said child together. And while they do get away initially, they eventually are hunted down by the military before they're able to safely leave the planet. As such, they're forced to fight and defend their new little family unit. Alana is a deserter who takes no issue with fighting back, but Marco actually swore to be a pacifist since his daughter was born, but something in him snaps when he sees his family in danger. He reverts to a version of himself probably not yet seen since his own time in the war, brutally fighting the attackers. Fortunately, Alana is able to rein him in and calm him down, reminding him of his pacifist oath. Number seven, Dream versus Karanzon. One of my favorite fights I have ever read in any book, comic or otherwise, happens of course in the Sandman series. 
This fight happens during the first main arc in the Sandman comic series, when Dream is tasked with reclaiming his symbols of office. In order to get back his helm in the comics, he must journey to hell to battle and defeat the demon currently in possession of it, one of Beelzebub's, a demon named Karanzon. This battle is described as being the oldest game, that of basically imagining. One can lose through hesitation, inability to take up a solid defensive stance, or lack of imagination. Karanzon conjures up the anti-life in the hopes of finally beating Dream after a long fight. Initially badly beaten by Karanzon's move, Dream does end up winning in the end, proving himself the epitome of imagination, as what else are dreams really, by conjuring up the concept of hope. Number 6. Batman and Robin vs Green Lantern Oh boy, what can I say about this one? Well, it comes from Frank Miller's all-star Batman and Robin, so I think you can imagine how it goes. I will say Frank Miller is like the king of brutal fights, I would say in comics. Yeah, all-star Batman and Robin is honestly, it's an experience. If you want to check it out, all the power to you. In issue number 9, Green Lantern comes to try and tell Batman he's taken things too far, warning him that he's putting people in danger and imploring him to please stop. Seemingly, Hal's house call is triggered specifically by the fact that he's accusing Batman of kidnapping Dick Grayson, who he does not know but suspects is Batman's sidekick, Robin. Batman doesn't want to hear it and blatantly denies Hal's accusations, even though, as we know, they are true. As we can see from the beginning of the issue, Batman has also been preparing for Hal's arrival and for the specific confrontation by painting everything yellow. Needless to say, it doesn't go well for Hal. Number 5. Bane vs Alfred What could possibly be worse than the loss of Batman's parents when he was young? How about the loss of his confidant, his butler, and the person who, for longer even than his own parents, has honestly been a parental figure to him? Alfred. I don't think it gets much more brutal than this. While the death of Batman's parents is obviously very tragic, Alfred was there to help pick up the pieces afterwards and in essence helped to raise the boy even before his parents passed. He was probably one of the closest people to Batman. Alfred was shockingly killed by Bane after being kidnapped by the villain. When Damian Wayne didn't take Bane's threat seriously and set out to save Alfred, Bane responded in kind by ending Alfred's life. Not only is this brutal for Alfred, obviously, but this was all part of Bane's greater plan to basically break Batman again, but this time psychologically. Number 4. Joker vs Batman Not just any Joker either for this point, we're talking about Emperor Joker. This is an extremely powerful version of the Joker if you aren't familiar with him. He basically gets 99.99% of Mr. Mixia's Pitalix power after tricking him out of it. Mr. Mixia was going to give Joker only 1% but as I said he was tricked out of basically almost all of his power instead, which is I imagine what would happen if you're trying to make a deal with the Joker. The Joker uses his newfound power to do a bunch of brutal things, one of which is tormenting Batman on a daily basis before killing him each and every day, only to resurrect him, bringing Batman back so he could of course do it all again. This was so traumatic for Batman that eventually when Superman does manage to use Batman's existence to basically defeat the Joker, restoring the world to normal, Superman is forced to take Batman's memories of the daily torment actually from his mind, otherwise Batman would actually have been unable to operate as a hero because this experience literally breaks him. Number 3. Superman vs Lois Lane This one really is a brutal beatdown, and it's not one that's intentional, FYI. It's hard to read and honestly helps to justify most of Superman's actions, at least at the start of the Injustice Elseworld story. At the start of Injustice, Joker and Harley Quinn end up manipulating Superman into basically killing Lois, by making him think he's fighting Doomsday. In doing so, they not only have Lois killed, but also her and Superman's future offspring, and all of Metropolis gets blown up too. Unsurprisingly, Superman does not take this very well and ultimately becomes corrupted by the pain of all this loss. Number 2. Damian Wayne vs Damian Wayne Batman has lost a lot of Robins over the years and a lot of adopted sons, but Damian Wayne is his biological heir, the son of Bruce Wayne and Talia al Ghul. He was raised by Talia and the League of Assassins without Batman even really knowing of his existence until years later when Talia just dropped him off on Bruce's doorstep. Initially the two did not get along very well, Damian insisted on killing their enemies as he'd been trained to do his whole life. But eventually, he did come around and began to see the value in his father's approach to fighting crime, respecting it and even honestly admiring it. Just as their relationship began to evolve into something more resembling a true father-son connection, Damien was tragically killed by the heretic, a death that Batman can't even bring himself to avenge when he realizes that the heretic 
is Damien's clone. Number one, Mera versus Aquaman. Mera and Aquaman are often presented as being romantic partners and sometimes as a crime fighting Atlantean duo as well. However, this doesn't mean they never fight, especially when things get really comic booky. And during the Blackest Night, things did get really comic booky and they actually had some really good reason to fight. At that time, Aquaman had been possessed by the Black Lanterns, joining their forces, and Mera was driven into a rage by the death of last standing family member, Tempest, causing her to become a Red Lantern. One of the coolest bits of character development for her, which allowed Mera to really tap into, I would say, years of bubbling rage. Talk about a woman and her power. During one page in Green Lantern issue number 50 from the 2005 volume of the series, Mera takes on the deceased Aquaman, and when he attempts to emotionally manipulate her to basically win her over, trying to distract her from her rage by attempting to bond with her over the loss of their son, ultimately it fails. Mera frightens him off masterfully by responding, I I've never wanted children before seemingly defeating both of the undead that are confronting her here with her liquid napalm blood. Number 10, Punisher versus a criminal. This is going to be an interesting one to try and describe. This devastating beatdown comes from Punisher Max issue number 28. If you don't know Punisher Max and you like brutal moments and storytelling, this might be a series for you to check out. In issue number 28 of the series, before he gets to the head of a criminal operation that he's in the process of stopping, Frank deals with the son of the operation's head, Christu, attempting to get information from him on his father, Tiberiu, and their associate, Vera. He attempts to get him to talk by seemingly numbing him and then using his organs as basically a uh, decor for a tree. We don't know of Christu's fate, but I can't imagine it ended well for him, knowing how Frank usually deals with criminals. Although he did promise that if Christu gave him the information he was looking for, he'd actually be okay, and Frank would use his medic training and knowledge to save his life. Though I personally wouldn't trust that knowledge myself if it was Frank Castle and he did that to me. Next on the list is the Hulk versus the Sentry. Okay, this is one of the craziest throwdowns in Marvel history. History. This one takes place in World War Hulk number five. So picture this, the Hulk, fueled by rage, obviously, returns to Earth ready to serve some serious payback to those who banished him from the planet. On the flip side, we've got the Sentry, this hero who's holding back because he's terrified of the enormous power he wields. Basically like the Marvel equivalent of Superman here. When these two finally face off, it was like fireworks on the 4th of July. Explosions, chaos, destruction everywhere. The Sentry unleashed his powers, sending the Hulk flying through buildings things like they were made of cardboard. But you know the Hulk, he's tough as nails, so he took these hits and dished them right back like a titanic game of ping pong. Now what's mind boggling here is the sheer power they both brought to the table. They clashed so hard that their energies actually cancelled each other out, reverting them both back to their normal human forms. But in the final moments, it was the Hulk who landed the knockout blow on the sentry. Now even after this fight, the Hulk still seething with anger almost tore New York apart just by taking a step. That's how crazy powerful he was, even after after tangling with centuries, so it's kind of safe to say that the Hulk technically won the battle, but man, the strength here on display was off the charts. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Number eight, Uranus versus Magneto. During an X-Men Red tie-in issue for the AXE Judgment Day event, in a fight that lasted barely a page and a half, Uranus completely, and I mean completely, destroys Magneto. And I really do mean, literally, destroys him. And never mind Magneto, although that brief battle is something to behold, Uranus completely wrecks most of planet Araco too. Well him and his army, but I mean still, wrecking a whole planet, that's insane. Well Magneto would later on get some sweet revenge on Uranus, in the first fight the two have here, Uranus manages to wrench Magneto's heart from his body, seemingly killing him. However we later learn of course that Magneto manages to stay alive to fight another day by get this, literally controlling the metal in his blood. What? Controlling its flow throughout his body, even without a heart. Basically using the iron in his blood to pump the blood throughout his body. That's what? That's crazy. This next one is honestly one of the most surprising, brutal beatdowns I have ever ever read. This one also comes from Saga. I love Saga, in case you didn't know. I'm not up to date on it by any means, but everything that I've read so far in this series I've been obsessed with, and I really do want to get up to date. I just need to, need to read a lot of things. 
<laughs> There's a lot of issues. It's just such a great series overall though, so it really is worth the time. If you haven't checked it out, I do highly recommend just getting even that first volume and giving it a read. It'll hook you. Just the first few issues should be enough to just blow your mind. This brutal beatdown is also from near the beginning of the story as well. The Will is a bounty hunter. He has also been given the contract to hunt down Alana and Marco, but kind of early on, he decides he might give up on the contract. Feeling he's already been beaten, he decides to use his unlimited credit card that he has that he was given for the job to um, basically entertain himself. But while pursuing this, entertainment, he runs into a really, really bad guy. Now most characters in Saga are very grayscale when it comes to their alignment, both capable of good and bad deeds. The Will, honestly, included. He's kind of terrible, but also he's got some pros. But I think we can all agree that this guy, the one he's up against, is like the actual worst. He's very bad. Needless to say, the Will surprised me by making very quick work of him discombobulate, bringing it to a new level. I don't even know if you can show it, that's how brutal it is. But basically, it's giving them one of these, the head squeeze. Moving on, the Whispering War is something we saw happen in both the comics of Walking Dead and the show. The show depicted the war a bit differently from the comics. There it was more like a literal war with armies on each side, and one side hunting down and eradicating the other in the end to win. Moving right along, Urizen is basically one of the worst of the worst of the worst when it comes to Spawn comics. He's a powerful villain and a mortal god who was basically imprisoned on earth by the combined forces of heaven and hell. Yeah, that's how bad he is. Heaven and hell were willing to work together to take him down. However, Urizen was eventually freed from his prison and escaped. This was a world ending scenario, not just because of Urizen's own power, but because his being unleashed was part of a plan crafted by Malbolgia to spark Armageddon on earth. When Spawn first fought Urizen, it didn't go well, to say the least, which is why when he returned empowered by the ruler of Green World, Gaia herself, Earth, the beatdown felt pretty cathartic. If Spawn versus Urizen was cathartic, this next point was heart-wrenching. One of the most heartfelt fights you probably weren't expecting is the one that happens between Throg or Thrag, I'm still not sure how we're gonna say that, I'm waiting to hear it, in the animated series, and Omni-Man. These two fought during issue 138 of Invincible in a rematch. After Throg had been banished, he created his own hybrid child army by teaming up with the Thraxans. He had a lot of kids while he was away, and when he returned, he sicked his offspring on Earth and took his own fight directly to Nolan. You might wonder how or why we'd ever feel bad for what happens to Omni-Man here if you're a fan of the animated series, but trust me when I say that Omni-Man is way more complex than you might otherwise think. Well, season one, and I would say kind of still the first half of season two, even paints him as like a pretty antagonistic and kind of like shady dude, there is definitely more to him than that. And at the end of the day, he's still Mark's dad. While the two have had their issues, Mark honestly does love him. Even when he's being a jerk, he loves him. Even when he's in denial, he does love him. And at this point in the comics, he was more redeemed than we've seen him before, which is why it was heartbreaking when we watched Nolan be brutally defeated by Throg, who not only put his fist through Nolan's chest, aiming for his heart, but then when he missed, he just tore Nolan open. Terrible. Switching over to a different comic series with this next point, Spawn and Zara are opposites. While Spawn is one of the most powerful beings in hell, especially after Malbolgia is defeated, Zara is God's most prized warrior. She was an angel whom God granted immortality to so she can never die. At a time in Spawn when the war between heaven and hell was very dangerously present on earth, these two meet up and Spawn, basically being God tier at that time, makes quick work of Zara, slicing her in half. What's even more brutal is that Zara would survive this fight, but only as like a disembodied head due to her immortality. Cause yeah, she can't die, which in that way kind of becomes a curse when you're just a head. Spawn might be brutal, but there is another series that I think of first when it comes to beatdowns. I talked about it at the beginning of the list. You know where I'm going. I wish I could limit how much I talk about Invincible, but truly it's challenging. I just love it so much. The series is just so good, and it honestly is some of the most brutal beatdowns in comic book history. So yeah, we're going back there again. I'm gonna talk about it again. This fight is now one that many know about thanks to the Invincible animated series. As Omni-Man's true motivations are revealed to Mark, the two come to blows, and while Invincible is reluctant 
reluctant to fight against his father, Omni Man is less inclined to hold back, honestly. This fight was so brutal, it quickly became one of the most iconic and most memeable ones ever. Seriously, it's between Invincible and Omni Man for me, and Anakin and Obi Wan in terms of like equally memeable and memorable brutal fights. Both of those are very memeable, I think. Next up, this has to be one of the most brutal fights within Image and within honestly all of comics. It spanned five issues and multiple days, with the series popping back to just remind you each issue, yeah, that's still going on. Those two are still fighting. I can't even give you one issue to read because that simply just doesn't exist. As it unfolds, it gets more and more brutal and gruesome. This is mainly because this fight goes down between Throg and Battle Beast. These two fight because Battle Beast has decided to team up with the Coalition of Planets and is sent to defeat Throg. But what he's truly after is not necessarily to um, complete his mission, but to die a warrior's death here. He sees Throg as his equal or possibly his superior when it comes to battle and hopes to die at his hands, or defeat one of the few who has actually managed to stand against him. To give you an example of just how intense this fight is, in the beginning, Throg is badly wounded when Ragnars are also unleashed from Battle Beast's ship at the start of their fight. Battle Beast was told that the Ragnars wouldn't be unleashed except as a last resort. And if you don't know this, Ragnars are basically some of the ultimate enemies against Viltrumites because they can actually break their skin. One of the few beings in the cosmos who can break a Viltrumite skin, to be clear. After defeating the Ragnars, Battle Beast notices Throg's wound and injures himself to match to once again ensure this fight is fair. So not only does Battle Beast turn on the Ragnars, but then he also is like, oh you're wounded? Me too! Now we fight again. And then they fight for days! 